All right, I'm going to read this just to make sure that I get it right. Cato is on the right track with its proposals to downsize the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Many of the department's programs originated in the Great Depression and are completely out of date and no longer needed, if they ever were. Downsizing the USDA would help move American agriculture into the 21st century. Welcome to We're Libertarians Daily. I am Hody Johns, and I am here all by myself today, and I'm here to let out a little rant in your direction. I've decided to do a series where I go department by department and look at the problems with each of them as far as the federal government is concerned. I'm just going to go in alphabetical order because I could rant about any of them. Uh, I've been missing a little economic talk. Uh, I got called a soy boy the other day, and I think it's because I've been talking a lot of social issues which I am a soy boy on, and not enough economic issues, which I am uh, not illiterate on. And so I'm going to try to introduce these at least once a week uh, until I run out of departments. Now there's only like 16 departments, so I'll, I'll run out eventually here, but, but we're going to start with the Department of Agriculture, and hopefully me raging on a podcast will help get my blood pressure down. And, uh, and hopefully shed that nice boy to, uh, the image that I have because uh, I'm tired of it. I'm ready to be the bad boy of liberty. So let's start with the U.S. Dep Department of Agriculture. Now that quote that I read to start off with was pretty scathing. Basically said we need to scale back the Department of Agriculture. Uh, they spend $146 billion. The Cato Institute, the, the study he's actually talking about... Um, said that we need to scale it back by $140 billion. So leaving only $6 billion left of the previous $146 billion. Uh, so you might say, oh, maybe that's got to be some crazy anarchist or some guy out there in La La Land or maybe some wacky libertarian or some guy who just wants to cut all programs. Maybe it's Ron Paul. Maybe it's me. No. Uh, that quote is from John R. Norton, the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. So when the Department of Agriculture executives start saying that, yeah, we could probably scale back by like almost 100%, it's time to look at this program and say, hmm, maybe they're serious about scaling all of this back. So we're going to go, let's just, let's just take the overall numbers here, $146 billion. So in your household... That's about $1,200 a month per household. That's $100 a month, or I'm sorry, $1,200 a year. Sorry, that got really crazy. $1,200 a year, $100 a month. Think about it that way. What could you spend $100 a month on? Oh, I mean, let's go liberal. Healthcare, social security, retirement. You'd spend it on your own well-being, you know? I mean, hey, you know, let's, let's be big government in some other way. You know, hey, you're looking for money to spend somewhere else. Well, here it is. Here it is. By the, by the Department of Agriculture's own admission, we can have $100 a month to spend on something else if we were to drastically cut back the size of this program. All right. So l let's look at this. They have uh, 90,000. Now, they're, they're actually down on this. They used to have over 100,000 workers. They're down to 90,000 workers now. 90,100 workers about 7,000 offices across the country. They spend a measly 5% of their funding on paying their employees. Now, 5% seems so little, so with all that funding, I'm sure they make very little money. Oh, no, that's $81,000 per employee, which is about 20% above your average household income. And nothing says public servant like all of our guys in the public service make more than our masters do. Right? I mean, you're not a public servant if you're making more money than the people that you profess to serve. So, so that's the ridiculousness of it all. Now, uh, 1789, just going over the timeline here, U.S. Constitution goes into effect. Nothing about farms, nothing about subsidies. Slowly, they start amping up. Federal lands start getting created. They have an agricultural committee in 1920. They develop these consensus. In 1862, they finally established the Department of Agriculture. Abraham Lincoln calls it the People's Department. 
So, you know, if that doesn't sound socialist enough for you, I don't know what will turn you off of it, but that's how it starts. And it starts by saying, okay, we've got all these lands that are ours. We say they're ours. The Morrill Act provides grants of the federal lands to the states, but the states are required to spend them on studies and colleges that teach you about agriculture. So if they make a profit, that's okay, but they'll only let you open a farm there and operate it if you agree to give some of your profit to creating these colleges. So have you heard of these A&M colleges? Have you seen their football teams? Uh, maybe their big math programs? Oh, all of these were supposed to, are funded by a, a fraction of these, farm, these farms that put out these profits. Now, times have changed. It's not 100% that way anymore. But this is how it began. This is why you see all these Texas A&Ms and Mines A&Ms and Colorado A&Ms and all these A&Ms and why every state basically has to have an A&M because it's their way to say, all right, federal government, you won't let us use that land unless we play your game and make a college. So that college there is a token. And I'm sorry that if you go to an A&M school, I know some of them are actually pretty good. Uh, but this is, this is, they are funded by that farming. So if you think about it, when you go to the grocery store, you might as well say, mm, okay, I'm going to buy this watermelon and I know a certain percentage of it is, uh, you know, going to, to my local A&M school. You're funding something else. We talk about privatization all the time and how schooling is better when it's free of the government's tendrils. The USDA has made it so that you are paying for college when you buy watermelons, when you buy cheese, okay? It's ridiculous. All right, so let's start with there. Sorry. Um, they've made a second moral act. It's been, uh, it, it's been updated. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve Act allows presidents, of course, the executive office, to set aside forest reserves out of public lands. This is, of course, 1891, in, in high, the highlight of the Theodore Roosevelt, and let's, let's have some national parks. Okay, the Forest uh, Service is part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we're not all just talking about food. That's part of it. This begins in 1891. They start uh, looking at these national national parks and setting them aside and saying, okay, this is not, no longer going to be a state thing because, you know, in 1891, they were starting to put concrete and fill up the Grand Canyon, right? Being sarcastic, of course, they were not. The states were doing plenty good. Believe it or not, the states actually cared about tourist attractions. But let's nationalize it just in case for some reason they forget that they care about tourist attractions. Because that makes a lot of sense, right? That suddenly our incentive would go away. Suddenly we wouldn't understand economy. We'd just say, oh, that's weird. I thought paving over the Grand Canyon to make way for condos was suddenly going to be a profitable venture. I thought plugging up Old Yeller, because or uh, yeah, Old Faithful, <laughs> plugging up Old Yeller, killing the dog, uh, plugging up Old Faithful, and making sure that that geyser never goes off again, might be a smart thing to do, and you know just put a house on top of it, because I'm sure that house will be worth more than the you know hundreds of thousands of tourists that come to see Old Faithful. I'm sure, right? Anyway, uh, so. So the scandals actually start in 1905. We're getting old. Uh, USDA was caught uh, gi giving these uh, personal gains to somebody who worked there who owned a lot of these cotton plantations, and he provided a lot of cotton subsidies. Now, let's understand what a subsidy is. Okay. A subsidy is when I take money from a taxpayer and I give it to a thing. Now, I don't know where you are on the libertarian spectrum. Most of us hate that. But some of us say, okay, maybe sometimes everybody should chip in for defense or everybody should chip in for this or everybody chipped in for that. Well, everybody chipped in for this guy's cotton. We caught him. In 1905, we caught him. We fired him. We said, you're out. I'm sorry. So there we go. We wrap that up. We never got rid of the cotton subsidy. 
to this day, over a hundred years later, we got rid of him, but we forgot to get rid of his cotton subsidy. Subsidies, okay, there are 90% of our subsidies go to finance five things. Now you might say, okay, I see where you're going with this. We have to subsidize some things. Cotton, you know, maybe it makes some clothes. I'll bet we subsidies, uh, subsidize sugar snap peas because that's healthy. Or some nice grape tomatoes because, you know, we need, we need the kids eating healthy. Maybe carrots or lettuce. Uh, no. Cotton, rice, soy, none of this stuff is healthy for you. Some of it's not even food in the case of cotton. And it's all, it, it, it's just, it, it's all fattening. The majority, the majority, over half of these, okay, over half of these subsidies, $20 billion in subsidies that you pay to the farmers, go to farms owned by guys with the last names Turner and Rockefeller, okay? Mark Rockefeller, Ted Turner. They get over half of these subsidies. So when you think like, oh, these poor farmers who are struggling to make it, well, how could, oh, Hody, how could you talk about cutting their, they're already just barely hanging on as is. Okay, first of all, <clears throat> Your average farm household in 2014, we're going back four years, your average income on a farm for that household was $134,164. That is 77% higher than the U.S. average. All right. They say that's average. You know, you got those Rockefeller farms. Okay. Okay. You got me. You know some math. Let's talk about the median farm income which is 81%, or I'm sorry, $81,637,000 per household, which is 52% higher than the median U.S. income of $53,000. You are paying money to people richer than you to finance things that make you fat or that you wear them. The cotton industry doesn't need your subsidy. Here's the problem with a lot of these subsidies. Look at oranges from Florida. People almost worldwide recognize that Florida is the best place to grow oranges. That little peninsula there is right at the, it's got the perfect latitude. Okay, the weather's right where they want it. The humidity's right where they want it. And farmers are tearing down their orange groves because they are being paid to grow cotton instead. Paid to grow corn instead. So instead of growing a grade A, grade A orange tree, we are growing an F grade cotton bush plant thing. I don't care. I know some biologist is going to get up in my grill about that, but you know what I'm talking about. It's too much. Wine country, California, begun tearing it down. Why? Why is Wine County shrinking? Oh, well, it turns out they're being paid money to stop growing grapes and start growing cotton and corn and soybeans. Because you got to make sure you get your mayonnaise, damn it. If you don't get your mayo, you know, people are going to be grumpy, and that's just the end of democracy. So they get to decide on these five things. They haven't changed it. We found these, these scandals. They still don't change it. They start doing food stamps all the way in 1964. Food stamps are one of the largest welfare programs. Major fraud and abuse. They currently cost you $40 billion a year. Of that $40 billion, we identify $1 billion as waste and fraud. Just fraud. Stolen, misplaced, given to somebody, waste and fraud. Which would, okay, you know, you say, okay, eh, you know, that's a little over 2% of the money to fraud. That's maybe not so bad. Except that of that $40 billion, $5 billion is dedicated to employees that make sure that waste and fraud doesn't happen. 
So you might as well let it happen at that point. It can't be more than, than $5 billion. So with oversight, which costs $5 billion, they managed to find but not stop $1 billion in fraud. Out of control insanity. You can't run a business like this unless you're the government because you can monopolize it and make the rules and do whatever you want. I went a little past where, we wanted, where I wanted to go. Let's talk about sugar. In the mid-1900s, they found out sugar wasn't very good for you. So the government did a very upstanding thing. Finally, you know, because soybeans are just fine, everybody. Eat your mayo. But we decided that we really had to look at sugar. Because Americans are starting to get diabetes. You know, let's look at this here. So we put tariffs on it. We said, you are not going to harvest that here. You're not going to use those products here. We put regulations on businesses that had sugary snacks. So that put a stop to it, right? We stopped eating sugar in 1950, right? We just said, okay, we've finally been punished enough. We learned our lesson. No, here's what happened. No, we, we lost 100,000 American jobs in the sugar industry both farming and, you know, Brock's. Willy Wonka cut, had to cut back. And they went overseas. And so we stopped buying Willy Wonka, right? They went overseas. So there's no way to get a hold of them anymore. Oh, no, wait. We imported them. By doing these regulations, these ridiculous regulations, we sent our sugar jobs and our sugar production overseas to be done by somebody else so that we could buy it from them. Did nothing but cost us jobs and made it so that we had to pay an importation fee to get this sugar in for us. Food stamps have gone ballistic. I mean, it's just gone crazy because once you open the box, it doesn't stop. Right. Once you once you start, you say, ah, oh, it's just going to be a little bit here. But don't these guys deserve food stamps? Don't those guys deserve food stamps? Less than half of the people who are actually on food stamps report being in a dire situation. We've gone from, uh, let's see here, 2016 now. Since, uh, from 2000 to 2016 the number of recipients of food stamps went from 17 million people to 44 million people. And the cost quadrupled. So it's getting bigger and bigger. And it's not actually solving anything. This is the problem. In 1900, there were 11 million farmers right because we didn't have all this automation you got to remember there were 11 million farmers today there's only 3 million farmers so back in 1900 back in 1900 there were 2900 USDA employees okay so if we've shrunk to almost 25% of this the size all right, so then there's probably only, what, 500, 600 USDA employees? No, I already told you that at the beginning of the episode. There's 90,000 of them. We keep getting more regulators to regulate less people in an era where it's easier to regulate people. It's bananas. We pay the regulators more than we pay the job doers. They had a huge, huge thing to do with the Great Depression, too. They, uh, during the Great Depression, 25% uh, of the population lived on farms had less than half the average household of urban, inc uh, urban households. Federal commodity programs came about to alleviate that income disparity. In, in 2014, fast forward, about 97% of all farm ho households, which is about 2% of the U.S. population, are wealthier than the median, median U.S. House, household. So these similar numbers. So I understand they used to be in dire straits, but here's the problem. You create and expand a program because people are in trouble, as opposed to letting the free market take care of it. Free market might give you some lumps. All right, maybe some people spend a little bit of time unemployed, 
But now what happens? We can't get rid of it. It keeps growing. We don't need it anymore. We applied everything, everything we could to fix the problem. Problem's done. And we keep applying fixes. The mechanics is still working on our car when our car is perfectly operational. I, I mean, he's shining the wheel. And at some point, I just say, look, I need to drive this car. The free market needs to be in charge, especially of something like food. So I've gone really hard after their biggest, their, their, their biggest program, right? The food programs. $102 billion. That's what that one is. That's their biggest program. Making sure that, that you eat your mayonnaise. Farm programs, another $33 million, billion. Sorry, million. Come on, we're talking about government here, right? Silly me. Billion dollars. To make sure that farmers get paid more than you do, even though they're already making more than you. And to make sure that they're growing the right food. Because heaven forbid we grow the best oranges and wine in the world. We need to make sure that you're eating your mayonnaise. Last one I want to look at, the Forest Service. We've already gone over the Forest Service in a uh, major We Are Libertarians episode. Definitely worth listening to. It's the one about the California wildfire. Killed a bunch of people. And it's really sad. You know what's really sad? That you paid $6.2 billion, made the mistake again, only to have the Forest Service do nothing while those people died. Do nothing while all those th that land was lost. Here's what they're supposed to do. We found out in the 1960s, because of the redwood trees, fascinating story, that we needed to let forest fires happen sometimes because we weren't getting any new redwoods. They did some geology. They did some agriculture. They actually did some, some, some investigation and found that these fires have to happen for redwoods to grow. Be just by history, they analyzed the dirt and said, okay, you can see where these forest fires happen every so often. And the redwoods only grow because of what that ash creates, because of the, the residue from a forest fire. So we say, okay, so forest fires need to happen, but let's make sure we do controlled burns around areas that, that are in trouble, right? Like around these residential areas. We need to do these controlled burns. That way, when a forest fire happens, it gets so far and then it has no fuel. That's the smart thing to do. They found this out. The USDA found this out. I hate to give them credit, but they did. They figured it out. The problem is, is it's the 2000s now, and nobody likes to see stuff on fire, so we kind of stopped doing it. So the USDA, that knows that controlled burns are what we need to do in order to save lives, has stopped doing controlled burns. They've asked for it in their budget, but they just say right now we just don't have the money to do it. If your one job is to make sure that people don't die, well, I'm sorry, the Forest Service also does other terrible jobs. But if your main job is to make sure people don't die, maybe you should get on that with some of that $6.2 billion instead of slamming another smoky bear at us and telling them it's your fault because you're the only one that can prevent forest fires. God makes forest fires. You can't stop it, and the USDA knows it. Other problem with the Forest Service? Paul and I did an episode about this. What do you think? Is there more pollution or more litter on private or public property? Take a guess. You probably know. What a surprise that private industries care about what their parks look like. They want to make sure there's no graffiti. They offer more amenities. Oh, and get this. If you were to get it like a, like a tax credit, like what you're supposed to get for education, right? If you say, well, I want what I pay for national parks back. It is cheaper to go to, to a private park than a national park. National federal agencies run national parks horrendously. When I call for the privatization of these parks, I am calling for saving them. And that's something we should understand, that we need people to understand if we're libertarians. The U.S. Department of Agriculture is utter garbage. I don't even have time to get to the number of scandals that they've got. I don't have time to get to the number of lobbyists they've courted, money they've taken, buyouts that they've done for all their big business buddies. 
for the loans that are subprime. I don't have time for it all. But you already know it happened, so what's the point? I can give you a bunch of specifics. They're right there. I really love the Cato Institute's downsizinggovernment.org. I will put that in, uh, in my show notes because that's where I get a lot of these numbers from. But we already know. So it's time to act on this knowledge. Get rid of the Department of Agriculture for agriculture's sake. <laughs>